Hi, I'm Michael Peter Lansman, and today, once again, after a long hiatus, I'm interviewing Frank Tomako. Frank, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Frank, you've done it again. You've come out with an amazing book. I hate the fact that each one of your books captivates me and brings me to new levels of, do I believe this? Do I not believe that? Awakening into the 3D world is is a book onto itself. Some people already talking about it have compared it to Jane Roberts' Seth material and the Edgar Casey material. Mostly you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel um, that it does and doesn't compare with, with those uh, writers and, and channelers? Well, you know, I actually gave some thought to that and it occurred to me the real comparison is not what they brought forth or how they did it, but that I'm paying attention the way they did. You know, over many years, you've heard me say, everybody can do this if they want to and if it's important to them. And I think it's just that's where you're seeing now the result of 25 or 30 years worth of practice. With you? For myself, yeah. yeah. Now, what Jane Roberts did, you know, bringing forth a, an entity that, that dictates the books word by word, I can't do that. And what Edgar Cayce did, talking to sources that went back, you know, to... Atlantean and pre-Atlantean times, I can't do that. But like everybody else in the world, I'm here to do my work, not somebody else's work. So, I mean, you know, you could say, well, Frank, that's really like Jane Roberts. It isn't. What it, what it is, is it's like Jane Roberts' concentration on it. And uh, my theme song always is, other people can do this. It's just a matter of it being important to you. And because you've practiced for 25 or more years, you tap into what I feel is otherworldly wisdom. I think so. I and, think so. And that really, for me, is why I, I draw that line of continuality between the Jane Roberts and the, and the Edgar Casey materials. Well, that's right. But, but again, to my mind, the more important thing is, yes, I have tapped into a source of wisdom. So can you. So can anybody. So anybody watching this can do the same thing if they're willing to invest the time. That should be a very hopeful thing, because anything that somebody knows and tells you, it's just rumor to you. It's secondhand to you. The only way you know it is when, when it's happened to you, and then you know. This is your third book in the series of the reader materials. Um, let's do just a little recap for people who turn into this video for the first time. Who and why is Rita? Okay, well, uh, Rita Warren was a Ph.D. psychology uh, professor. She was actually, when she got her, her uh, she was analyzed, and she was analyzed by one of the people who had been analyzed by Carl Jung, so it was that close a, a relationship. She did a gateway at the Monroe Institute back in 1979, and it totally transformed her life. Uh, she took early retirement from her teaching career, and she came down here and became the first um, director of Bob's Consciousness Lab. Bob Monroe's Bob Monroe, yes, yeah, that's right. And, and that lab was basically a, a way to use sound to put people into an altered state and then talk back and forth to them while they're in that altered state. And most people had their own agendas, but Rita also had this long series of questions in her mind. What's it like on the other side? What's it like after death? You know, the, the questions we all are concerned with one way or another. And she couldn't get answers to them. Even though the people were in altered states and even though there were quite a range of abilities, the questions that Rita wanted to answer, she couldn't get the answer to. And, and uh, she would get things that would just just sort of, you know, well, it's hard to explain. <laughs> You'll know when you get here. <laughs> there are no problem. And it sort of, you know, left her mildly frustrated. In the year 2000, I did a series of uh, 10 sessions in the black box with Skip Atwater as, as a monitor. And I transcribed them, which is a tremendous task, i got to tell you. I that sent them out. And, and Rita would read those. And the next year, she gave me a, a gift of another session, and then later I said, boy, you know, I wish we could do this all the time. And she said, well, you don't need the, you don't need the black box. And it turned out I didn't need the box, and I also didn't even need the Monroe tapes, although I used them at first just, you know, for, for comfort as much as anything. So she and I did a series of, um, well, there are 22 sessions in the first book that I put together. Over, we would do it every Tuesday, and we did it for months. Our fifth session was on the night of September 11, 2001, which was a very interesting session, as you can imagine. I can imagine. 
Well, after that, Rita died in 2008. She was 88 years old at the time. The book that came out from those sessions was yep. called Sphere and Hologram. Okay. And that's two analogies that the guys used. They were always trying to, to make an analogy what our physical life is like. And they said, well, it's like a sphere. And then they said, well, it's like a hologram. And they deliberately gave us more than one analogy because they said every analogy shades off into some other meanings. But if you have two of them, you can see more easily where the, what they have in common. This is a clever strategy. It's beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, we, we put that, I didn't actually get that book out until after Rita was dead, but I had her introduction that she had written, so we put that in there as well. She died, as I said, in 08. In December of 14, I had a dream that basically said, okay, it's time to get to work, and sat up the next morning, and my, my process is to sit with a pen and a journal, and, and I will be in a relaxed state, receptive state, I should say, really, probably, and I'll either have a question or I'll say, okay, I'm open for business, you know, and then I take down whatever seems to come. Sometimes it's word for word, sometimes it's, I know the sense of it and I, and I find it, and sometimes I have to really fish for it, you know. So you'll see lots of back and forth in, in my journal. I sometimes think the smartest thing that I did accidentally was that I left all of those back and forth and all those false starts and all of the, you know, going off in dead end trails, I left that in the transcripts. I didn't try and pretty it out and make it look like I knew what I was doing more. What, what was the purpose? Well, at the time I just thought I was being honest. Now I realize it's also encouraging to other people because when you start, you, you're very well aware of all your limitations. You're not necessarily aware of how much you're accomplishing. And so I wanted to, you know, that, that's a, a prevailing theme with me. I want people to realize it's easier done than said. <laughs> you know? So anyway, so Rita came in in December of 14, and we went on for six months every morning, almost every morning. And that boiled up into a big, massive paper, and, and Bob Friedman agreed to publish it, and he did it in two. He took the first three, wor three months as Rita's World, and the second three months as Rita's World Volume 2. Uh, and, and Rita came to you for Awakening um, with new information that's different than the first two. Oh, yes, yes. Um, I don't know how I would describe the, the first two. It's almost more like a, an orientation or a reorientation. That here's what it looks like from this side, what your life that you're living lives, or you know, how it appears. This book, Awakening from the 3D World, which I originally was going to call Awakening from the 3D Trance, talks about, the, you know, you've read and you've seen people talking about near-death experiences. Well, she didn't have a near-death experience. She went all the way through it. And now that she's on the other side, she's saying, here's what our life is like, you know? And, and um, here's why, A, you don't have to be afraid of dying, and B, it's an integral part of life, and it's like breathing in and breathing out. You have a life here, and then you're back on the other side. You have a life here, you know? It's, um, I haven't seen anything like it. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that nothing else exists. I mean, easily could be, and I haven't been aware of it. But this is the first one I've ever seen where somebody who's on the other side knowing what the questions are because she had the questions when she was here. That's beautiful. Knowing those questions, she says, here's, here's the answers to what's worrying you so much. So she comes up with these wonderful descriptions of the process. And the one I like the best, I think, is the children on a slide. She said, children like sliding boards because it gives them a sense of being totally out of control knowing that they're in control, right? But sometimes if it gets a little too much, they grab the side of the sliding board because they don't, you know, they don't really want to be that out of control. And until they let go of the sliding board, they don't go any further. And she said that's more or less what goes on as we transition from this side to that side. It's, nice. <laughs> it is. And, and one of the things that I like the most about the way I worked with Rita is she comes up with very simple pictorial examples like that that will stick with you. You know, once you hear about the sliding board and, and, and hanging on clutching and then having to let go at some point or another, then it, it, it makes it easier. I, I've been looking at different, um, different discussions on, on Facebook and, and other websites about the book, and people are getting all kinds of excitement because it, it, it makes them look at life and death in, the, in a different way. Well, that's what, that was the hope. And, and what is it that she says about living a, a good life? 
um, that's new and refreshing. Let me put aside new and refreshing, and I'll tell you what I, what strikes me as the most important part of it. Okay, great. And that is, you, when we live our life, we tend to think of life as being centered here on on you know, here and now. That's what we're here to do. But if you realize that there are no accidents and no coincidences and that the problems that you face are all part of who you are and there's a reason for it, it relieves a lot of that anxiety. Now she's saying, look, there's also no reason for anxiety on the other side as well because, in fact, you can't really go wrong. <laughs> you are what you are. If you, if you think of yourself as having to match some external standard, you're going to fall short. I mean, even if you even if you won, it still wouldn't be the right thing. But if you realize that you came here to be the best person that your particular mixture of qualities can be under whatever circumstances there are, how, how are you going to fail that? You can't fail it. That's very okay. It, it, is that the most important thing the book offers people? What will people get out of this book? <laughs> well, what they bring to it. <laughs> uh, Trying to say what's the most important thing is like little kids who to try and, and say, this is my first best friend and my second best you know, <laughs> They try and put things in order that don't really order except arbitrarily. I, I'm serious about that. What people will find most important will, be, will depend on what they bring to it, what their questions are, what their problems are. Uh, as you know, I put all these on my own blog as, I, as they came out. And Which is? Uh, uh, of my own knowledge, all one word, dot com. People would read that blog and would respond and would have questions or have objections, and that was nice because then you had the backup of having a community, so it wasn't just working in the dark or working in isolation. This isn't just Frank and Rita talking in a in a back room. Exactly, exactly. Um, you you've continued speaking to Rita. Um, is there more coming? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People keep asking, me, are there going to be more books? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but yes, she came in uh, the following year, and this one is, I think, I just finished editing it. It's going to be called It's All One World. And what she's basically, she, and boy, I'll tell you what, it's a simple concept, but it rearranges everything. And what she's saying is, you have the, the 3D world that we're accustomed to, and the non-3D world that we think of as the other side. I mean, you just heard me say it a minute ago. But it's all one thing. The other side isn't the other side, it's right here. All the dimensions and dimensions themselves is probably a, a metaphor. Sure. But but it all is in the same place. And once you realize that, you realize that the non physical and the physical can't possibly be separated. It's it's even closer than two sides of the same coin. It's it's the same side of the same coin in a sense. And yet we live under a spell of thinking that the non physical doesn't even exist. Well, some people do, but other people live their physical life knowing that it exists. Um, and I think that that's a, one of the keys to a lot of the philosophy and the religion that you've seen in the past is that it's a way of showing people you can live here and just remember that this isn't the end of the, the whole thing. So. So, I mean, we're concentrating on the here and now because that's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're here for. But it doesn't mean we have to only do that. It, you have to have, or let's say it helps if you have a society that recognizes that there's more than just the here and now. We've tried living without it and it doesn't work. We'll, we'll, another interview, we'll, we'll talk about the evolution of, of humanity, because I think it really hits on that as well. What, what would you like as your closing statements in, in this video? It's always the same closing statement, Michael. I can do this. I've showed that I can do it. I started from ground zero. Other people can do it if they're willing to put in the time and if they're willing to learn, because, because the process isn't necessarily obvious right at first. And that's one of the things that I'm hoping the Rita book will, will make clear to people, how you learn uh, to discern the difference between, well, I'm making this up, and no, it's actually there. And if it is making it, if you are making it up, why? Because that can be as interesting as everything else. So, so first and last, I'm always saying, you can do this. <laughs> and I think it's important to do it. Frank, this has been wonderful. Yeah. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Thank you so much. Well, I hope so. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.
perfect. Now we're just gonna check so we don't. You know how we're just gonna check takes away all the perfect. <laughs> <laughs>